Hi, I'm Carl Franklin in Connecticut in the United States, and I've recently started a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. G'day, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet since April of 2014. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I also have type 2 diabetes, and we're going to share the progress of my journey into ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis, and hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail. Uh, we have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them. Uh, we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put sh links in the show notes uh, to cite the, any research supporting claims that we make. Right. You'll probably work out pretty quickly. We're both foodies. We love to cook and we love to eat. We're also going to share some of these great recipes that we eat on this diet Every episode, uh, Richard shares a recipe and I share a recipe to an essential keto meal that we eat regularly. So let's start podcast number five, The Fasting Show. Yeah, so we, you know, we thought about doing the protein show next, but we can get to that later. Yeah. We're both sort of in fasting mode right now, so that's why we wanted to share it. But before we start, Richard, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week? Yeah, sure. I mentioned last week that almond uh, oils are high in omega-6 PUFAs, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and, but that's a bit unfair to it. As I mentioned last week, most fats are a combination of the various fatty acids, mm -hmm. uh, and the fat in almonds in particular is only 12% polyunsaturated fats, of which they're omega-6, mm -hmm. and 30% monounsaturated fats. So it's actually quite a good fat. So it's more monounsaturated fat, which is the best kind. And one in eight only is, is uh, yeah, 12% is uh, polyunsaturated. So if you eat a lot, it will contribute a fair amount of omega-6 uh, polyunsaturates to your diet, but in small amounts, it likely won't be a problem. Uh, macadamia oil, however, has less than 1% of polyunsaturated fats and 61% monounsaturated fats. So there's really no reason not to use macadamia oil. Yeah, or just eat macadamia nuts. They're the yeah. a staple of ketoers and low carbers everywhere. They're actually they're actually Australian, you know. They're actually bush tucker, so it's an Aboriginal food. I thought it was a Hawaiian thing because you know you see them advertised as mono loy, for example. Is yeah, that... I think Captain James Cook came to Australia first and then went to Hawaii, probably. Probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's probably how they got there. All right, real quick. If you haven't been listening, a ketogenic diet, which is what we both do most of the time, that's right, is a carbohydrate restricted diet that's also higher in fat. We restrict our carbs to less than 20 grams a day, and we don't count carbs. We just we we don't eat bread, we don't eat sugar, we don't eat any real carbs. The only carbs that we get come from green leafy vegetables, from nuts, that's right. You know, from incidental carbs. So uh, we also eat enough protein, just enough protein to maintain our muscles. And everything else is fat. It's typically 75% of your calories come from fat. And about 25% of your calories come from protein. So that's the basis of it. So how, how are you doing, Richard? I mean, you just finished your second fast, right? That's right. I had a rough week, actually, because I oh. had a bit of a, lap, a lapse on Monday. Mm. Um, I went to a charity event um, that was uh, for Oz Harvest, which is one of these charities that uh, pick up food out of restaurants that's not eaten, not being used, and hand it out to charities. Oh, great. And I hadn't eaten all day, and the only food there was some pastry-based canapes, and I... I just said, oh, yeah, stuff it all. I'll have, I'll have, I'm going to have some of this. Right. And uh, so I put on a couple of kilos. Really? <laughs> just, just, yeah, it, it was all water weight, of course. Yeah, I had but... that experience the week before when I had some problems with maltitol. Right. And I had put on five pounds, which is about two kilos. Yeah, yeah. And I put, I put that on in uh, one day, and then the next day it came off after I went right back on. So I think it's the benefit of being keto adapted is that, you you know you don't have to worry about that one day lapse. Did yours come off the next day? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. So um, you know you just I've always said you know get back up on the horse you know right. uh, keep calm and keto on. So yeah. um, I started fasting on Thursday uh, Thursday at eight pm, mm -hmm. and I finished that today Sunday uh, in Australia, and uh, I finished it at about 
uh, I guess, 4 p.m. Uh, on Sunday. Oh, wow. Uh, I had about 64 hours of fasting, and I finished it with a 32K bike ride. So that uh, I think I'm going to I'm going to do at least 30K of uh, cycling every Sunday uh, as a regular form of exercise. It's not essential in a diet to uh, – we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but it's not essential to exercise. In some cases, it can be bad for you, but mm. – um, just, just I feel great after exercise, and I, I re- particularly feel good doing it when I'm far, in a fasted state. So we'll talk a bit about that too. Great. So how are you going, Carl? Well, uh, as we'll talk more about fasting, I decided to bite the bullet and try a fast. And I was going to do a fat fast, mm-hmm. but it turns out that a bunch of us on this Facebook uh, community, Keto Ninjas, we decided to all fast for the weekend. Some did a fat fast, some an intermittent fast just during the day. And you and I decided to go full full bore. This was your second one, but there was my first one. Right. And while I, so I'm fully keto adapted. So hunger wasn't a problem for me. I've already depleted my glycogen reserves. Sure. So I didn't have to go through that. I would call it pain almost, you know, <laughs> exactly. the first two days on a ketogenic diet can yeah. be really rough on a person. But I didn't have to go through that. So I wasn't hungry. And I started my fast on Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. That was when I ate my last bite. Right. And I didn't eat anything until this morning, Sunday, at about 6.30 a.m. Nice. When I made myself a nice bacon, egg, and cheese uh, sourdough sandwich. And it was mm. wonderful. Very so nice. I lost about four pounds, which is about two kilos. It was all fat weight because... Like I say, my glycogen reserves have already been depleted. And that was the only place to get energy. And you're probably burning up, you know, your size, you're probably burning up uh, 3,500 kilocalories per day at least. So, yeah. yeah, you probably lost, you probably dropped a pound a day. Um, and as long as you're fasting, that probably would keep going. So, yeah, that's what I did. We'll get into why I didn't have any problems and why my body didn't self destruct and all of that yeah. in just a minute. But first, we have a new segment. It's called. Mail. Mail. Justified it. We don't need no alibi. Put it out of the way. Awesome. Mail. <laughs> mail. <laughs> really original, isn't it? So th- it's not just mail, but these are comments that have been left on our website. Sure. Or sometimes they might be email. Dudes at 2ketodudes.com is our email address if you want to go there. Of course, the website is 2ketodudes.com. You can go there, leave a comment. All right, so this is a this is an email that came in. Hi, guys. I'm on a doctor-recommended ketogenic diet to help with my GERD symptoms, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease. I got sick in high school. Doctors confused my symptoms for asthma made me gain a lot of weight on steroids, Mm. prednisone, to help the symptoms that weren't there. I went from 160 to 235. Ouch. I'm only five feet. Became really self-conscious and uncomfortable in my own skin. I started trying to work out and eat better, or so I thought. After losing some weight and reaching a stall, I talked to my doctor who suggested a ketogenic diet. Nice. I used to get sick multiple times a day, every day. And now I rarely get sick, maybe once every few weeks. I've lost more weight. I made it down to 158, which is two pounds below where he started. Yeah. Although I've climbed a bit since Christmas. Okay. Love eating my keto foods, and I still sometimes feel I'm missing out. But anytime I cheat, I feel like crap the next day. Ah. Bad stomach cramps. Yeah. Feels like a brick in my stomach, etc. So I can now see the way I'm eating now is so much better for me. Sorry to ramble on, but I'm always interested in hearing and reading keto stories and enjoyed both of yours immensely. Keep sharing and thank you. Oh, that's awesome. You're welcome. And just as a reminder, give us a review on iTunes and send us an email about any topic you want us to talk about. Again, it's dudes at 2ketodudes.com. Yes. All right. So let's talk about fasting. I learned about um, why fasting isn't dangerous and how it's actually beneficial, especially to those with metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance by watching a video from Dr. Jason Fong. And this video is a lecture that he did called The Etiology of Obesity, Etiology being the origin. It's only part four of a six-part lecture series, but this is called The Fast Solution. And so he talks about the problem with diabetes and metabolic syndrome is insulin. 
As we talked about in the insulin show, when your levels of insulin are too high, it blocks the mechanism that allows your liver to burn the body fat for fuel. And so the, most people that diet go on a calorie restricted diet. When you restrict your calories and yet you're not in ketosis, there's less calories to burn. But since your insulin levels are still high because you're still eating, you're not able to burn the fat for fuel. And so the sugar spills over into your blood and we have this problem. And you're essentially starving because there's not enough glucose f because you're restricting your calories. There's not enough glucose for energy and you can't use the fat for energy because your insulin is too high. See, what your body does is when it notices that you've got slightly less energy coming in, it slightly restricts the energy that you're expending. Right. So there's a whole, there's like 14 different things other than going for a run or doing some exercise, 14 different things that your body does with energy and it dials them all back. And so if you're eating 2,000 calories a day and you're burning 2,000 calories a day and you're in stasis, if you suddenly eat 500 calories less, well, you lose a little bit of weight to start off with, but then your body starts reducing the amount of energy that you're using by 500 calories. That's right. And so this everybody gets this, that when you diet traditional diet of calorie restriction and exercise, it's hard because you're always hungry. And the reason you're hungry is because you're starving because you can't burn the fat for fuel and there's not enough glucose for fuel. So this is a real problem. And then what happens, as Richard just said, is your metabolism slows down. So you're actually expending, you're burning less because your body's saying, hey, we don't have enough calories coming in and I can't burn the fat. So I'm going to have to slow down the rate, you know, turn down the dial on my furnace basically and, sure. and burn less. So what happens is then you give up and you start eating. Your body wants to you to start eating to get back to that weight that you were at. Now, before I talk about what happens when you fast, there's two states that you can be in when you start fasting. One is you're eating carbs and you're, you haven't done ketogenic, you're not in ketosis, fasting is going to be very hard for you because those first couple of days, you first have to get into ketosis. And as everybody knows, uh, even on a ketogenic diet, uh, it can be challenging. Yeah, those first couple of weeks are pretty awful. First couple of weeks, yeah. You get the keto flu. That was our first show, right? Yeah, that's right. Once you get through that phase, you're keto adapted, your body is now better at burning uh, fat, not as good at burning glucose. And so now you're primed and ready to fast. Right. So when you fast and you are in ketosis and you're keto adapted even, I don't know as if you have to be keto adapted so much as just in ketosis, just over that first maybe week or so. You certainly have to have your glycogen depleted. So, cause otherwise, right. otherwise you're going to spend the first two, one or two days drawing down on all your store of glucose. Right. If you don't have any of that, you can skip that whole time. Correct. Now, glycogen, as Richard says, is where water weight comes from. Glycogen is your store, your, your temporary storage mechanism for glucose. That's right. Yeah. And there isn't much of it. There's no. about a day's worth, as That's we've right, said yeah. before. And, and it's three quarters water. Right. This glycogen. Mm. So that's why they call it water weight. It all goes away. All right. So now your glycogen is depleted. You're in ketosis. Now fast. Now what happens? Well, you go even further into ketosis. Because you're not eating carbs, because you're in ketosis, your liver burns the fat, especially in the liver and around the liver and around the midsection as fuel. Fat is stored fuel. It's stored food. The reason we get fat is to store fuel for when we don't have food. That's right. Anybody who thinks otherwise isn't looking at the obviousness of it, right? And this is one of the myths about fasting that I learned from Jason Fong is that people think, oh, you're going to burn your muscles, right? When you starve yourself, you'll eat your muscles. Right. Well, that's only true if you have no fat on your body. Yes. If that were true... Let's say we're a caveman and we're eating, 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 nom, 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 nom. We put on a lot of fat. Yeah. And now wintertime comes and it's a terrible winter. It's like the winter of 2015 in New England, right? Yeah, it's okay. terrible. <laughs> There's no food anywhere. And so what would happen if your body just shut down, started eating the muscle when there's fat? Yeah. That's kind of like saying, oh, I got all this wonderful fuel here. Uh, but I'm going to eat the stuff that I actually need to get up and move and find more food. Right. That's kind of silly. 
Yep. And you think about it, yep, that's silly. Ketosis is your energy storage, your energy mechanism for three quarters of the year. If I, I'm convinced that ketos, nutritional ketosis is the original metabolic state yeah. for three quarters of, the, of our life when fruit was not plentiful, which is basically three quarters of the year, right? Yeah. Summer, summertime is, uh, is when you yeah. go on a high glucose diet and the rest of the year, traditionally, you know, you'd have a very low glucose diet. Yeah, and it just makes a whole lot of sense. So there are a few things you should do just to be safe. You should probably take a multivitamin, even though um, studies have shown, and these are studies done on humans, not on mice. That's good. That's a, that's a good start. <laughs> yeah, the science says that when you fast, you're A, not hungry because mm -hmm. you have a source of fuel. You are feeding yourself. Your body is feeding itself with your fat. Yes. But to be safe... Uh, you should, I think, and it doesn't hurt, to take micronutrient supplements. So a multivitamin, yeah. maybe some fish oil, maybe some uh, definitely increase your salt intake and electrolytes, potassium, magnesium, calcium. Yeah. However, as you said on, I think it was the last show where we talked about your first fast, there was a guy in Scotland who fasted for 382 days. I know. Just insane. taking a multivitamin. Yeah. And he lost... All his weight, he was over 400 pounds. Yeah. And then within a, over a year, he brought it all down, took it all off. Yeah. Turns out fasting is healthy when you're prepared for it and when you do it right. And uh, I got this tip from you, Richard. When you're hungry, drink something salty and hot. Yeah. I, I find that if I'm hungry for something savory, um, sometimes I'll just have a little bit of salt first just to see if that's what I was craving. And nine, mm. nine times out of 10, um, the, the, the craving goes right away. The thing is that when you're fat adapted, you're well positioned to uh, live on fat. And so it's a ready source of energy for you. So you don't feel a lack of energy. Um, and most, um, I mean, a marathon runner with 8% of body fat still has over a month worth of energy, assuming they don't eat at all. So, you know, that's a very extremely thin person. So, um, you know, we, we've got several months worth of energy on us. And right. Probably not 382 days, but still. So, Richard, you outline uh, seven levels of eating that progressively decrease insulin. So let's talk about those. Let's start off with a standard American diet. It's lots of insulinogenic food. So it's food that sends you insulin up, like uh, high levels of carbohydrates and high levels of mm -hmm. protein. More mm. than a maintenance level of protein. So what that means is you eat that food, you're going to get very high levels of insulin. And if you have that chronically, that will cause insulin resistance, which as we've said in the insulin show, that sets up a positive feedback loop that is very difficult right. to get out of under. Yeah. So that's the first, the first step. And then the next step, which will slightly decrease your insulin, is a calorie-controlled low-fat diet. Right, the calorie-restricted diet I was talking about. Right, yeah. So, the, so, so this is... Um, this is like uh, 1,500 calories or so, thereabouts. Everybody uses a different number of calories, but uh, right. most men would probably go through about uh, 2,500 calories a day. 1,500 calories a day is a 1,000-calorie deficit. Mm. A calorie-controlled low-fat diet is still a lot of carbs, and it's a lot of lean protein. So uh, so you will still have high-ish levels of insulin. The next step down is a low-carb or a paleo-style diet, uh, which is not uh, the very, very low levels that we would have. And also, these diets have quite a lot of protein, more than a maintenance level of protein. So mm. insulin, is, as we mentioned last week, insulin is raised by two kinds of sugar and two kinds of amino acids. And so um, it, both protein and carbs will raise your insulin. Right. And protein to a lesser extent, but still you have to reduce your protein to the point where your insulin comes down. And, and by the way, I noticed that uh, one of the things in reading Dr. Fong is he says that when you're on a ketogenic diet and you're eating, you know, the, the right ratios and stuff, your insulin goes from abnormally high to normal. Yeah. All right. But normal insulin really isn't enough to, to reverse insulin resistance, which is what fasting does. That's right. So, so the fourth level is a ketogenic diet, and that is low carbs and the minimum amount of protein. So that's much less insulin. Mm. That's what we're on most of the time, and that keeps our, our levels of insulin fairly low. Uh, but the next level after that is intermittent fasting, where you only eat during a narrow window of the day. So let's say you're right. an 18-6, so 18 hours of the day you don't eat, and 
some of those, eight of those hours you're probably sleeping, so that's easy to do. And you just eat during a window of six hours or maybe you're 24. So you, you, you fast for 20 hours and you eat for four hours every day. That Now that uh, you have a little amount of insulin that's being released during the feeding cycle, but during the fasting cycle, you just have your base load of, of insulin. So that's that's like the next step beyond the ketogenic diet is intermittent fasting. And one of uh, one of the guys in the software development world who I've interviewed on my software podcast, John Sanmez, okay. he says that he fasts every day until 5 p.m. and he's been doing it for almost two years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not sure when he cuts it off, but in other words, he's got a very small window of, you know, when he eats. Yeah. So that means that he's he's going to have a, a, a insulin secreted for handling that metabolism for that small window. And the rest of the day, he's going to have his base load of insulin. The next, right. the next level after an intermittent fast is something called a fat fast. And this is where you only yeah. eat fat. Now, fat won't cause the pancreas to secrete insulin based on the food coming in but the brain notices that you're eating some calories and it can tell the, the pancreas to uptick a little bit of insulin and so yeah. there is there is a little bit of insulin coming out during a fat fast but the nice mm. thing about a fat fast obviously is that you still have calories coming in so you're not calorie restricted i would say you're probably less hungry on a fat fast but I'm not so sure. No, it's actually, less effective, and your insulin's not low enough. And then, the, then what we did this weekend was what's called an extended fast, and that's where you just don't eat for several days, and um, your insulin for that time is limited to just your basal amount. And the strategy that you need, which of these seven you need to do, will depend on how much insulin you actually produce. Mm. And somebody who's type two diabetic produces a lot of insulin, and they can probably get regular benefit from keto, but yeah, you know, there will come a point where they're going to hit a stall and then you're really going to have to probably hit either intermittent fast or extended fast to get beyond that point. And that is exactly what I did this weekend. Yeah. I had been more or less at the same place going very slowly down, but uh, for three or four weeks, actually, and I broke through it and it was amazing. I what a great experience. Yeah. I'm, I'm plan, I plan on doing it again. This is what I'm going to try, actually, Richard, and tell me if you think this is crazy. <laughs> but I'm going to try um, doing that next week for the same time, oh, Thursday wow. through Sunday. And, and then if that works for me and I keep feeling good and I keep going, I'm going to do it every weekend. That's pretty hardcore. Now, I, that, I don't think that's uh, crazy at all. That's, uh, there was a popular diet called the fast diet. Michael Mosley invented it or popularized it. And it was a 5-2 diet where for five days of the week, you eat whatever you want. And for two days of the week, you eat 600 kilocalories, uh, which is not as low. If we're fasting, we're, we're, we're eating almost nothing. Yeah. And, and that, that diet was able to reduce people's insulin load as well. So, and, and people did that for years. I don't think I could eat high carb in between. I just don't yeah. like it. I don't yeah. like the way it feels. Um, like I, I said, I started this day with a, with a sandwich on sourdough bread. Yeah. And those are the only carbs that I've really eaten since February 1st. Wow. But I figured that after a fast, I can pretty much make that up in water weight. Yeah. So what I plan to do is break my fast with, you know, something along those lines and then just go right back to keto for the rest of the five days. Yeah. So the, the mechanism behind the whole thing is, as we mentioned, is insulin. And, and I have an analogy that I like to use when I describe this stasis, which is, I mean, the body has a lot of stases. One of them is glucose, making sure that we keep within a, we spoke about this during the sugar show, making sure that we keep within a safe amount of glucose. We also have a stasis for how much energy we're storing. And basically, as we mentioned before, insulin is the driver for this. And it's a little bit like you're sitting in a climate controlled room and, uh, when the uh, whether the heater turns on or the AC does depends on the stasis of the room, what its temperature is, and also what what you set the dial. You know, if you've set the dial to eighty degrees, then you know when when the room goes below eighty degrees, the heater will kick in and and it will bring things up. And if the room goes above eighty degrees, the chiller will kick on and and cool the room a bit. What a great analogy! Thanks. This is similar to how our bodies uh, manage whether we burn or store energy, and the dial in this particular case is how much insulin you're producing. It's really the average right. the average amount of insulin during a day, and that's why things like the intermittent fast, it it lowers the insulin for part of the day, and that lowers the average over the whole day, and that then 
drives your energy storage strategy. So the question I have is, if fasting for longer periods of time dramatically reduces your insulin resistance, is fasting for just a part of the day enough over time? In other words, is all of that fasting time cumulative or is it better to fast for a longer period of time less frequently? So I don't know the answer to that. And if anybody does, I'd welcome somebody explaining, uh, somebody um, offering an explanation and uh, you can send it to our email address. What I, what I do know is that there are several hypotheses for how to reverse uh, insulin resistance. And one of them is to just reduce liver fat and pancreatic fat, and that reduces the pancreatic burnout, which is all part of the process of somebody getting high sugars because they're diabetic. So just locally reducing the fat deposits in the pancreas, it's something like only one gram of fat in your pancreas is enough to turn you diabetic, and reducing that one gram is enough to turn it off. So that's one hypothesis, and there is some good um, research to back that up, a good experimental mm. research and MRIs and what have you. Um, there is another competing one uh, um, hypothesis which Jason Fung uh, gave, which is basically that having less insulin in the system means that your sensitivity increases to insulin. Right. And that also has some validity as well because part of the reason why uh, all of our hormones are secreted in pulses is, bursts, is to reduce yeah. yeah bursts is to is to prevent that uh, resistance from building up and both of those may be true we don't really know so but Jason Fong says that uh, 14 days of fasting is sufficient to uh, reverse your insulin resistance so. but he, does he say that 14 days has to be consecutive or can it be intermittent I mean that's the question yeah. I, I I imagine that you're going to get there quicker if you do it all at once but it's much more difficult obviously and the I think that's the popularity of intermittent fasting is that it's easy to fast for a day yeah especially if you're keto adapted yeah. it's nothing to go uh, a day without eating. I think one. I think one of the things that we have to admit is that the first day is different from the second day. Yes. Second day, you don't have hunger pains. You don't. You, the first day, I, I feel quantitatively different, and then the second, third, and fourth days seem to be all the same. So it wouldn't surprise me if you were fasting for one day, like doing alternate day fasting. You fast for one day, yeah. you don't fast for another. You, you're probably not getting to that really efficient level. That's just my speculation. But you can sustain it for a longer because it's less uh, of a strain, so to right. speak. But but it's even not a strain. I <laughs> just to, just to set the record straight here, folks. I exercised like Richard. I didn't go for a bike ride, but I, you know, I walked on the treadmill. I felt fantastic, full of energy. And this is another myth that uh, Dr. Fong busts: is that, you know, oh, I'm going to be lethargic because I don't have any food and blah blah blah. Guess what? If your insulin level is high, even if you eat a slice of bread, you're not fasting because now your insulin is high and you're not burning your fat. Yeah. So cut it all out. Don't eat anything. Yeah. And then you're 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 burning your fat and you're surviving on your fat and you do not get tired. In fact, the opposite is true. Your adrenaline level goes up, That's your right. growth hormone level goes up, Absolutely. which protects your lean muscle mass. That's right. Your muscle mass does not go down. That's the other myth, isn't it? Everyone says, you know, if yeah. you if you fast, you're gonna lose lean muscle mass. But in fact that's the opposite happens. Yes. So yeah. The opposite happens. Yeah. That's right. You lose yeah. fat. Yes, exactly. And you lose it quickly. So, and and as we said, it's uncanny how not hungry you are. Yes, absolutely. So I, I'm. I was surprised. I when I first started fasting, I think I mentioned this to you before. Um, when I first started fasting, I I basically bet myself that I couldn't do it. I gave wagered myself that I wouldn't be able to do it, and I didn't think I would be able to do it. But I thought I oh, will give it a go. We'll see how we go. And I surprised myself, and and um, so much so that two weeks later I did it again, just to <laughs> just to see if I yeah. could do it twice. <laughs> so, and it was just as easy. One last thing about fasting is, if you're diabetic, you're probably taking metformin or something else to lower your blood sugar. So you may need you you should consult your doctor because you may need to cut back on that when you fast. Otherwise, you may run the risk of dropping your blood sugar too low. Yes, definitely. So if, you're, if you do have type 2 diabetes, you should be checking your sugars regularly every day. And if you find your sugar is too low, the first thing to do when fasting is just take less metformin. But your doctor needs to be aware yeah, of that. Yeah, you should, you should. If you're type 2 diabetic, you should um, tell your doctor what you plan to do. And if you're taking sulfonurias and, and others, other um, drugs that lower you, you, your sugar, uh, lower your blood glucose, then definitely uh, you should do that. 
Right. In my personal case, my normal blood glucose is about 5.2 millimoles, and I think that's about 80 or so. And I take metformin. I did through my fasting process, and my blood sugars went down to 4.0, uh, which is about 70 uh, milligrams per deciliter. Um, that's good. And, and that's great. Yeah, that is great. And they didn't go any lower than that. So I was the first time I did it, I was monitoring it, and I was – um, you yeah, know, very careful to make sure that I did. Once you get down below 3.5 to 3.0, then you start getting uh, into uh, worrisome areas. Okay. I'm, I don't think we really need to go into all the stuff about the obesity code, which is Jason's book, but just to recommend it, this book is wonderful. However, if you watch the, um, the lectures on YouTube, you're going to get all the critical information. Yeah, I, I actually got I got the book just the other day on my Kindle and I'm in the process of reading through it. Um, it's a ten dollar book, so you know it, it's also uh, uh, while you can get probably most of the the content from these ex they really are excellent lecture series, the etiology yeah. of uh, obesity. And he really goes into detail in the book. He does, yeah. So um, and he also nails a lot of the a lot of the myths. He spent many years doing these video series, he's condensed that all now into a very pithy and very um, direct nailing of all of these myths, like the calories in, calories out myth. I love it. It's awesome. All right. So quick advice on fasting, just tea and coffee, by the way, very good for you. Uh, green tea especially seems to satiate hunger. Yeah. I'm not so sure, but whatever. That's that's what they say. Sugar-free chewing gum is okay. One thing that I like to do is I like to take... Uh, apple cider vinegar, yeah. and just a teaspoon in a glass of ice water with a packet of Splenda. Nice. And it's almost a little juicy. Mm. You know, it's kind of like apple juice or apple cider. Bone broth, as we said before, really great. Richard has an awesome bone broth recipe in the Insulin Show. Yeah, it could have been, yeah. Insulin or Sugar Show. Yeah, yeah it was one of those first few. Uh, butter, if you want to put, a, I put a little bit of butter in hot water with a little salt mm. at mealtime. Nice. I know that you take bone broth and you froth it up, right? Yeah, I, a... I put bone broth into a magic bullet, like about two tablespoons of bone broth. That's a blender. Into, into a blender and I add uh, I add some boiling water and and some smoked salt. Uh, you know, if you get, if, you know, if you're going to have salt, you may as well have the good smoked stuff. Smoked salt. Yeah, this is the good. This is the Maldon smoked Did salt. Did I mention we're foodies? Yeah, we are. I use Himalayan yeah. pink salt. Oh, well, and, uh... very fancy. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, great. Now, when I first, the first time I did a fast, this time around, Julie did it with me. So everybody, oh, great. Everybody in my life is all fasting this weekend. It was just incredible. But it's um, very cool. It is very cool. But the previous time, it was just me. And when Julie would have a meal. I would have this uh, whizzed up um, bone broth mixture, and it, it sort of goes white, like almost like a mayonnaise kind of thing. It's, it's really quite nice. Yeah, I'm going to do that next time. This time I took your advice and put a little bit of butter in as well. It was that was delicious, and, and that that satiates you a little bit. And it's gonna that's a little bit of butter in ketosis is going to burn off in like an hour. Yeah, it's like not even going <laughs> to. The other thing I did when I was cycling last time, last time I cycled, I was getting some foot cramps, and that's. Uh, usually an indication that your hydration's off, you, maybe your sodium levels are off. Yeah, other electrolytes too. Electrolytes, yeah. So what I did was I I got some uh, fresh water and added uh, salt to it, uh, added some light salt, which is both potassium and sodium chloride, and yeah. put a squirt of Mio, which is like a sugar-free um, flavor, uh, like an orange or lemon, I think. Okay. And – I drank that when I was when I was riding. It was like a keto version of Gatorade. It was like keto aid. Great. Yeah, it was very awesome. Good. Yeah, you'll have to post the recipe for that. And speaking of recipes, recipes, it's time. Could you say you'll do for a little? Recipes, 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 recipes. <laughs> You're first. Oh, I'm first? You're first this time. Okay, well, t today we, I just spoke a bit about butter. I've actually got a recipe for making butter on my blog. All right. Um, and so, somebody actually asked me what my blog was. I may as well give it out here. It's easy low carb, E-A-S-Y-L-O-C-A-R-B.com. Um, and the recipe is for homemade cultured butter. Yeah. Now, one of the real joys of uh, low-carb, high-fat diets is that it gives you permission to rekindle an ancient friendship with butter. <laughs> and the best butters are ones that are cultured. What does that mean, actually? Well, what you do is you, um, to make it culture, you introduce lactobacillus. So it's like a yogurt or buttermilk. If yeah. It's fermented a little. It is fermented a little. So you're taking cream and you're fermenting it a little bit. So it's basically 
further taking out the sugars, the residual lactose left in the cream, it reduces out. Yeah. But it gives that really interesting uh, flavour to it. And in fact, in particular with uh, with butter, the flavour is is it's like that fake flavour that they put on popcorn, that butter flavour that they put on popcorn. Oh, right. It's like you can imagine that that is a watered down version of the stuff that is in this butter. Oh, wow. In this cultured butter. So it's really, it's quite, quite uh, delicious. Now I got to try this. And one of the things that you call for the, well, the key to this is this mesophilic type B starter. What is that yeah. and where can I get it? Well, you can get that from a cheese shop and it's a uh, lactobacillus. It comes in a powdered form but you can actually use probiotics so you can just get um probiotic powder and uh, open up a capsule and and can we use yogurt you can use a yogurt if you but the thing is you need to make sure that it is uh, a cultured yogurt that hasn't been pasteurized if it's pasteurized all the culture's been killed ah. so you put yogurt into cream if it's already ki- the culture's been killed you're not going to get anything to grow and cultured buttermilk wouldn't do it if it's been pasteurized and 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 and, and really uh, i mean you shouldn't really buy Milk products that aren't pasteurized, in my opinion. Yeah, so that's there's true. a lot of things that can grow in milk. All right. So I'm going to go to my cheese shop and I'm going to say, give me some what? What do you call it again? Mesophilic type B starter. The other thing is once you've made your first butter, you can use the buttermilk that you made from the first butter to start off the next the next round. So once you've got it going, you can have butter then for the rest of your life. Just like sourdough. Pretty much like sourdough or like yogurt and what have you. First of all, you've you've got to pasteurize your uh, cream and milk first because you want to make sure that there's no bacteria starting off and then you want to introduce the bacteria that you're going to use. So, But only the good bacteria. Only the good bacteria. So so basically, you've got to have a bit of pasteurized milk and you're going to put in the, your starter. 23 to 25 Celsius is the, is the mesophilic type B and that's actually 75 to 77 Fahrenheit. So you need to get okay. it into an environment. It's basically a warm room um, right. and you let it basically give it uh, 12 to 24 hours to grow and it'll turn like a little like a yogurt mixture mm-hmm. you've got your culture in in a little cup and you've added it to the cream and you put it in a container and you leave it in a warm spot for 24 to 48 hours so to grow okay. the initial culture was 12 to 24 hours to then have that culture spread through your cream is uh, two to four days. Wow. And what will happen is the whole cream will start to start to clot a little bit and it'll be a little bit like uh, like a thick yogurt. And then you're going to beat it. Now, you probably, if you've done any home economics or whatever, mm. you've probably been through the lesson where you, uh, you whip cream and you accidentally make butter, right? I've actually done it by putting it in a mason jar and shaking it. Oh, that's that's hard work, but yeah. It turns into butter. Yeah, it's good exercise, though. Yeah, it is. So, uh, so it's like a shake weight, and so you've been. Yeah. So you've got now. Now that point where your home economics teacher would say, "Hey, you've you've taken the cream too far. It's turned into butter." You're not quite there yet. You want to keep going until it really gets yellow, and you'll start to see that the buttermilk is draining out of it. The buttermilk's like a milky liquid that drains out of it, and so you put basically pour that off, and you squeeze the butter and. One trick you can actually use some, um, you can put the mass of butter in your hands in cold water. And because butter is really mainly fat, it'll start to solidify. Mm. And so then, it, then it'll be easier to squeeze the uh, buttermilk out. So, and, and basically what you end up with there is a very tasty butter. Now, if you can't get mesophilic type B starter and you don't want to make your own butter, there are actually cultured butters like Lurpak, which is a Danish style that you can get at Costco and uh, in Australia and in America. And co- mm. Lurpak is probably 80% of the way there. So uh, I would highly recommend uh, trying some cultured butters. And, uh, you know, if you feel if you're up to it, making them is definitely uh, is definitely taking it up to the next notch. All right, it's my turn. Yes, Carl, what have you got for us? I have got nothing as complex as cultured butter, let me tell you. <laughs> that is so awesome, though. And I, you know me, I love molecular gastronomy, and I'm always interested in hacking those things. A lot of my recipes, if you've noticed, going back the first four shows, they've all been to satisfy bread urges. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, that this is the first thing that people really need to know when they do keto is, how am I going to satisfy my bread cravings? So that's why I did the oopsie bread and I did the pizza. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of stuff. The waffle. The waffles. Yeah. Now I'm going to satisfy my crispy, salty, potato mm. chippy craving, which is another craving that comes along once in a while. And you know, yeah, you absolutely. need something crispy and salty. There's a lot of mush yeah. in the ketogenic diet. Well, that's and it. Crisp. Crisp yeah. requires, for the most part, 
Making something crisp requires getting your starch and frying it. That's right. However, there's another way to get crisp, which is protein. Taking protein and heating it up until it gets not burnt, but just before burnt. Okay. And of course, that is nasty most of the time. However, I'm going to give you the most delicious substitute for potato chips or corn chips or anything that you've ever seen. Nice. They are simply called cheese crisps. Ooh, I like the idea of that. Cheese Cheese, is good. Yes, definitely. Yep. Lay it on me. So this recipe is linked. It's on my blog. I use shredded Asiago typically, but you can use Parmesan or another hard cheese or even cheddar makes a really good crisp. But um, Asiago makes my favorite. Right. So one thing here is you want to avoid processed pre-shredded cheese that comes in a bag that, you know, that has a lot of... I'm not going to give brand names, but so you got to look at the ingredients. If it's like a mainstream manufactured cheese that's shredded, because they sometimes contain potato or other starches, so the shreds don't stick together. Sure. But in my grocery store, my local place, I can get pre-shredded Asiago that comes from the deli, so they shred it there. Nice. There's no starch. There's no nothing. All right. You'll also need parchment paper, which is a staple of- Any kitchen, yes. Yeah. And the, what's great about parchment is nothing sticks to it. Right. And you can you can get it really, really hot. So when you need a cookie sheet, move your oven rack to the middle of the oven, preheat it to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, place the parchment on the cookie sheet covering it, and grab a pinch of cheese. You don't need any butter or anything, anything else, just a pinch of cheese, about a tablespoon. Plop it down, start in the corner, and spread it out a little. Try to even it out a bit. Otherwise, it won't it won't be crispy in the middle. It'll sort of bulge up, and it will spread. But you want to just give it a head start. So how big a piece? It's about the size of a potato chip? Uh, yeah, th- three crisp. inches. Yeah, okay. Continue this way to fill the cookie sheet. Maybe 10 piles, maybe more. Depend. You'll see how much they spread out. They don't spread a whole lot. Sure. And you want to bake them for at least 10 minutes. And that's when I check them the first time. Usually, I end up going... 12, 13, 14, maybe even 15 minutes. So what are you looking for? It's going to start browning around the edges, and then the the white in the middle is going to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink, and when it's all shrunk, that means it's done. Nice. It's got to be completely brown. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it won't be crispy. It'll be chewy. Which is also a good thing. Yeah, chewy cheese crisps are okay. And I yeah. know that you did taco shells yeah. with uh, with cheese like this. You take it, you make a bigger one, you take it out and you drape it over a wooden spoon or something, That's right? it, yeah. yeah. And then you fill it, you, <laughs> the, the only problem is they're extremely porous. So you put put guacamole yeah. in it and you end up with a handful of guacamole. Squirtle, yeah. yeah, exactly. So yeah, they are porous. There's little holes in them, but crispy, crunchy, nice. and you could go through. I mean, of course, the problem with potato chips is you can't eat just one. In fact, that was the logo for that was the that was the Pringles story. That was the slogan yeah. for what was it? Pringles. Lays, I think. Yeah. No, it was Lay's. Oh, but okay. you can't yep. eat just one Lay's yep. Yep. and not one more and more. But yeah, Pringles was another. Once thing you like pop, that. you can't Once stop. Once you pop, you can't stop. Same, right. It's the same deal. Yeah. It's the same thing, but. Turns out just two or three of these will satisfy your cravings and you'll move on with life. Nice. It's wonderful. Mm. Well, that's what we got. Um, Kids, don't do any kind of fasting or even a ketogenic diet without checking with your doctor first. You want to get your doctor's blessing. You want to get a blood sugar meter and uh, keep checking your sugars. Don't do anything that's going to... going to hurt you no but our, our experience this weekend was that, that we feel great well at least i feel great i'll speak for myself i feel great and uh, i totally feel i feel good, good. Ah. so i'm yeah. you know i'm i want to do this maybe once a month i'm not as hardcore as you i'm not going to do it uh, every weekend but uh, i'm definitely want to do it once a month and um probably for three or four days similar kind of thing start on thursday night finish on monday so yeah, yeah that'll be good great Well, keto on, brothers and sisters. Keep calm, keto on. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. (laughs) 